What? Who, who are you? Wow. Rude. It's halfway-ish to Halloween, and I'm getting my usual late spring, early summer horror withdrawals. No, really, I don't know why exactly this happens, but I always seem to do something spooky this time of year. And this year is no different. Today, I will be tackling the first of the Dark Pictures anthology from Supermassive Games, Man of Medan. It is, however, a cooperative affair. So for the first time ever, we have a special guest reviewer. Hi, I'm Raparia. I'm a VTuber and you can find me at twitch.tv slash curseraparia, where I make a lot of goblin sounds while playing games. Thank you for joining me today. Man of Medan is basically the spiritual follow-up to the sleeper hit Until Dawn that kind of knocked the streaming world for six when it dropped in 2015. I was working at GameStop in 2015 when Until Dawn dropped and I gotta tell you, I just vividly remember us being unable to keep the thing in stock. Sure, it's schlocky, you know, very schlocky as a concept, but as it turns out, a visual novel with a few QTEs thrown in is an excellent mechanism to carry a slasher horror video game. And yeah, I would qualify these titles as visual novels, albeit with some very high-end visuals, animation, and performances. Also, hey, that's a pre-Oscar win Rami Malek. It's all good fun and an excellent date night. Just, uh, don't trust Rip around the wildlife. Uh, please, you're yes! yes! Do it! A few inches later... Dead. The deer know what crimes they committed. Look into their eyes and tell me that you see a soul. I... What? Right, back on track. Man of Medan takes that gameplay style from Until Dawn and this time goes for a ghost ship theme, starting in the late 1940s with two GIs having a little drunken excursion on shore. This is basically just a tutorial for the game's basic gameplay. Press button at the right time, move reticle in place, typical fare for these uh, playable movie type things. But there's one thing I have to mention that I cannot excuse right off the bat and that's black sodding bars. I detest when developers do this. And what's weird is that Supermassive didn't do this in Until Dawn. Now, I am playing on PC here, so I could probably, you know, find a mod to remove them, but why even ship it like this in the first place? I thought that you were a film nerd and you liked this kind of shit. Okay, valid point. However, even in the case of things like this, I have to state, Games are not films, and films are not games. Even in things like this that blur the line to the nth degree. After the boat experiences some, um, well, I would say rough weather, but whatever these guys have is a little past seasickness, our two idiots wake up and the first order of business, depending on if you are player one or player two, is to regroup. Player one ends up in the med bay with a picture of his son and a corpse? While player two is spending some alone time in a cell with a safe that he can't open, that definitely doesn't contain anything important. After catching up, shit starts to go majorly sideways when our pair finds another corpse and then, oh, wait, Rip, where did you go? Why is there mist everywhere? Oh, okay, 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 time to hide, time to hide. On my screen, I saw a ghost child, and I refuse to be a babysitter. Yet, you chose to be on this show. Self-burn, damn. And now, here's the narrator. Someone totally out of the pages of Hammer Horror. No, really, this character carries himself exactly like Charles Grey. Think like if his characters in The Devil Rides Out and Rocky Horror got smushed together. He explains that we are playing an unfinished story and that our choices will decide what can and will happen to our poor souls. Flash forward 70 years and we meet our group of teenagers for this horror experience. First up, we have brothers Alex and Brad, who at first glance appear to have a pretty typical banter-based relationship. Next, we have Julia, Alex's girlfriend, and her brother, Conrad, who is, um, just a little polarizing. 
He's a dickhead. Yeah, he's pretty grating. He's also played by the guy who was Iceman in those old X-Men films, so that's something. Rounding out, we have Fliss, the ship's captain, who ticks off the natural leader trope for the group. Just like its predecessor Until Dawn, all of these characters are schlocky stereotypes straight out of the pages of a horror film. And of course, there's a few different ways you can get them all killed off. This time around, the game is co-op. Each player has their own perspective and choices. This seems like a neat idea at first, but in reality, it's a balancing act, which was definitely not perfected in action. An example of that being that player two has a bias of more decisions to make, which of course ends up affecting both players. So continuing on with the story, while Adam was having fun deep diving a wreck with the lovebirds, I was on a boat dealing with some pretty awkward flirting until some fishermen showed up and Conrad forgot that this was the ocean and not a strip club. Must be from all that beer. Meanwhile, I was on the ocean floor in a sunken plane, finding clues and dead bodies. Also, eels. <laughs> eels up inside ya, finding an entrance where they can. Credit where it's due, the game seems to rely more on atmosphere rather than cheap jump scares. That eel aside, it seems to focus more on the unsettling mood for its horror element, something that gets compounded in the following bulk of the game. Right, so up until now, we've basically been dealing with the setup to the plot. What happens next is where things will absolutely vary depending on the playthrough. We both played through the game several times, twice in co-op, Adam again in solo, and then I did two single player campaigns myself. After some more drunken shenanigans, depending on a few choices, and Conrad making me plan how to get him killed, the gang heads to bed. Then the second part of the game starts. Turns out that those guys that Conrad pissed off earlier weren't fishermen or strippers, they're pirates! Since two of our characters are rich kids, they're the perfect targets for a little ransom. Or rather, they would be, until the pirates, after a healthy batch of choices, discover the flight map brought up from the wreck and inquire about the Manchurian Gold, this game's MacGuffin. Depending on a few things here, the gang can get in some seriously weird scenarios. Conrad can straight up escape on the pirate speedboat, or fuck around and get part of his ear cut off. The gang can either stand steady as a unit, or start arguing and blaming Fliss for everything. Brad might not even be present, still hiding in the ship's cabin, or the gang can even give him away. Regardless of whatever route you take, the bulk of the game is about to take place at the coordinates listed on that flight map, which just so happens to be the location of an abandoned freighter moored in the middle of the ocean. On now to the bulk of the game's horror, trippiness, and choices, the ghost ship, Orang Madame. Wait, whoa, slow down. They don't know that yet. And they might never find out depending on a few scenarios. As stated, this is where the vast majority of the plot happens. And yes, it's based on a real life urban legend. The Orang Madan was, or is, a supposed Dutch ghost ship in Indonesia. The name of the ship loosely translates to Mana Madan. Depending on the version of the story, it was either in 1940, 1945, or 1947 that a pair of American vessels picked up a distress signal in the Strait of Malacca. According to some stories, the two crews found the ship deserted. After the SOS messages declared most of the crew dead before it ending with, I die, and others claimed that upon leaving the area to call for more help, the Medan suddenly exploded and sank. Kaboom! There's also a common thread between versions talking about oil of vitriol, also known as sulfuric acid, that, according to a supposed victim before dying, created some kind of toxic gas, knowing that you can get an idea of where the plot is headed. After being shuffled aboard, the gang is put through a gallery of horrors, all coupled with this weird eerie mist all over the place, along with a lot, and I mean a lot of crusty old corpses. It's here where the most variation, depending on your choices, can happen, so it's hard for me to tackle it from a story perspective from here on out. So instead, I'll tackle it from a gameplay one. Effectively, this is a very high production value VN, and it breaks down into exploring areas, inspecting objects, and building clues in between quick time events, panic scenarios, and general weird stuff. It works, even if it is rather basic.
Sure, it works until you get to an invisible fucking wall. These things are everywhere. And for some reason, the game likes to switch control directions when you jump from screen to screen, which is a problem when you're trying not to piss off the pirate that's just taking you hostage. Swapping between characters, it is up to you and your partner to coordinate, swap details, and also communicate what is going on since, major plot twist, the Manchurian gold isn't gold at all. No, in true to the law fashion, it is a chemical weapon that was developed in China towards the end of the Second World War and has managed to leak all over the ship, causing massive, horrific hallucinations in anyone who breathes it in, which just so happens to be every last one of these hapless Muppets. They start seeing things appear and disappear between scenes, the narrator lurking in the background, eldritch abominations, zombie hordes, the meaning of life, it's... A uh, hell of a bad trip for our characters, but what quickly becomes apparent is that these hallucinations are not shared and each character is starting to experience a different reality from the others. Communication is key and you must work with your co-op partner to work out who or what you're even seeing in order to survive. It's a great mechanic, but after the first couple of times, it becomes very obvious to the player what is going on and that anything paranormal should be regarded as a hallucination. So when the gang finally works it all out, it all feels very... Well, no shit, Sherlock. It does have its moments aboard, though, and I have to give it something I do adore in a horror experience. The atmosphere here is top notch. Look at this scene on the ship's deck, just soaked in moonlight and rust. Mm, God, I can just smell that ocean air and deterioration. So that's what gets you off, freak? The big problem here, besides the controls, is the game's length. Before you know it, you're approaching the finale, which, even with certain choices made, seems to always end up in the same few scenarios. Does Fliss's boat's distributor cap get destroyed or not? If no, the gang will, after some Scooby-Doo style shenanigans, escape on that boat with the only potential changes being who is and isn't there. Did it get destroyed? Well, if Comrade escaped, he comes and saves the day. If not, well, here's the military, and I hope you're a fan of Cabin in the Woods. Overall, this game has problems. It's fun and it's worth playing through with a friend or even as a date night since you can finish a playthrough in around three and a half hours, but we notice a lot of issues like player two getting the bulk of the decisions. It was something like a three to one choice ratio at one point, and it often leaves you as player one just sitting there twiddling your thumbs, basically just watching a movie. If this were a point and click, it would have been a much better experience rather than dealing with the frustrating controls and invisible walls. There's also a problem with exploration in co-op that depending on what your partner is looking at, you can be ripped right out of reading an important detail or clue and forced into a cutscene instead of taking your time to enjoy all that atmosphere. And that's a real shame because exploring this ship and piecing things together about the fate of its former crew was one of the things I really enjoyed most about the game. It's worth playing through a couple times as a character's personalities can change depending on your choices which can make each playthrough a unique experience. Just be careful what you choose with Julia because a few wrong choices and she proves she didn't fall far from the same bastard branch her brother did. Seriously, the best decision I made was sending him off on a rescue mission so I didn't have to deal with him for the rest of the game. If I'm honest with myself, I entirely agree with Reparia on this. My other issue as well is the interactivity with the game isn't where it could be. Now I'm not going to call it a walking simulator because unlike a walking simulator there are actually consequences for your actions and it does actually try to engage you on a level other than pretension but I can't help but feel there's a lot of wasted potential here. I can't help but feel that Until Dawn was better than this. The good news is that this is the first in a quadrilogy, and there's three more to go, so, um, uh, Rip, since we've done the first one, do you want to do the other three sometime? That could be fun. It could also be torture. Depends on the kind of characters they throw at us, because Supermassive Games seems to be really good at making utterly unlikable bastards. But I guess without them, you wouldn't spice things up by trying to get them killed. But it could be fun, right? You got Conrad laid, and I'm never going to forgive you for that. Okay, hint taken. Good night, everybody. <laughs>